what I say of science here, I say without condition that science is the latest and the greatest superstition. Many of you watching this video will be surprised, possibly irritated by those words of Moondog, the, the blind New York street poet. Well, you really shouldn't be. By calling science a superstition, Moondog is hinting at flaws at the very core of scientific thinking. And in this series of short videos, I intend to focus on some of those defects. But first, let me introduce myself. I am Ian Angel, an Emeritus Professor at the London School of Economics. What I have to say is contentious, but I hope you will find it informative, interesting, stimulating, enjoyable even. I am assuming that many of you actually believe that science is truth, plain and simple. You think that to say otherwise is just crazy. Well, I beg to differ, and let me assure you I'm not crazy, I'm not a crank, nor do I have some hidden ideological agenda. I have come to this radical position only after years of study. If you would like to learn more about my rejection of scientific truths, then you should read Science's First Mistake, the book I wrote with my good friend Dionysus Dometis. You can download it as a free PDF. Just follow the instructions on our website, www.sciencesfirstmistake.com. My own doubts about science began way back in secondary school, when I was first exposed to fundamental scientific concepts like center of gravity and the inverse square law. I can still remember how, at the time, some of these ideas struck me as rather silly. Was I really expected to believe that the center of gravity of a ring donut was not connected to its body? I was being told that gravity would grab at that point and pull the cake downwards. This is despite the fact that the center of gravity wasn't attached to the donut. I tried somewhat clumsily to explain my concerns to the physics teacher. But he fought me off by saying clever scientists like Albert Einstein had all the answers. He soon lost patience with me and told me to sit down and be quiet. Uh, in a new school, my survival instincts told me to stop disrupting the class, and so that's what I did. Despite all my doubts, and to my great surprise, I did rather well in the exams. Uh, I seemed to have a flair for manipulating scientific formulae. The theories appeared to work for me as long as I stopped asking those awkward questions. Consequently, I soon discarded all my reservations. I just accepted that science made sense and that it gave me a handle on the truth. It was many years later while reading the books of German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche that my reservations, these doubts, resurfaced with a vengeance, and my certainty in science began to unravel. Nietzsche had a wicked way of pointing out the enigmas in science. When one rows, it is not the rowing that moves the ship. Rather, rowing is simply a magical ceremony by which one compels a demon to move it. Nietzsche is saying something beyond human understanding, which he teasingly calls a demon. And he says, these are at work here. Our cognition can never fully comprehend the human condition. As a species, we are reduced to creating proxies in our heads, which describe the effects that Nietzsche's demons have on the world. These proxies like force and gravity. Uh, the proxies are what Moondog called superstitions. Because if they actually existed in the world, then we would be able to see them, touch them. But show me gravity. You can't. Newton's apple didn't fall because of gravity. It fell because that's what apples do, of necessity. 
Nietzsche is saying that gravity and all the other so-called natural laws do not exist in the world. They are all constructed in our heads and we use them to describe but we can never explain our observations. Now, I don't have time to expand on this proposition now but in future videos I promise to go into much further detail. Suffice it to say Nietzsche's ideas had turned me into an ex-mathematician and a non-scientist. As a catharsis I set about writing science's first mistake with my partner in crime Dionysus the Metist. Dionysus has a degree in physics and he too was having similar doubts. In this video series I hope to convince you that many of the ideas you take for granted in science and in technology and mathematics are in fact absurd. That's right, absurd. There's no other word for it. Of course I must concede that science has an amazing utility. Nevertheless, buried deep inside all of its theories, totally ignored, lie numerous demonic absurdities. Despite these anomalies, the usefulness of science tends to silence all criticism. The utility of science is taken as proof of both its validity and veracity. Consequently, science teachers indoctrinate us into denying all the absurdities so that we no longer see them. And finally, we accept scientific theory as self-evident truth. In this video series, I hope to rid you of that delusion of truth. In future, I will be mulling over concepts like force, cause and effect, gravity, and many more of these very useful yet absurd ideas. However, in this first video, I will start the series off by talking about the absurdity of numbers, specifically integers. And yes, I really do mean that numbers are absurd. Please don't tell me that the figures don't lie. I'm sure that whenever numbers fail you, as they must at some time or another, you will resort to Mark Twain's excuse. It's not the figures lying, it's the liars figuring. I totally disagree with this sentiment. For numbers do lie. Numbers are lies. They are what Nietzsche called instrumental fictions. For the invention of the laws of numbers was made on the basis of the error, dominant even from the earliest times, that there are identical things. But in fact, nothing is identical with anything else. But precisely here, error already holds sway. Here already we are fabricating beings, unities which do not exist. Subtle inconsistencies will arise whenever numbers are imposed on the physical world. Thankfully, most errors can be discounted with ease. Take, for example, the unique number 2 in arithmetic. 2 is the sum of 1 and the same number 1 because there can only be 1 1. However, when counting objects in the physical world, the number 2 is always and already at variance with the two of arithmetic. Indeed, in the physical world, for two objects to be the same, <laughs> they have to be different, not least in their relative positions in space. But we learn to ignore this paradox whenever we use numbers, and thankfully, most of the time, it doesn't seem to affect the utility of counting. When counting, we choose to ignore the differences between numbers in arithmetic and numbers in the physical world. Instead, we set out to categorize objects of interest and treat them and treat similar items as if they are all the same. Everything placed into a particular category is forced to take on the identity of oneness that is imposed on that category. Consequently, all the subtle uniqueness of each individual object must be deliberately discarded as being irrelevant to purpose. I can hear you saying this is just quibbling over the meaning of words, mere semantics. 
Does the discarding of uniqueness really matter? I will admit that for most applications, the answer to that question is a resounding no, it doesn't matter. Lumping together similar objects into a oneness can prove very useful, but only up to a point. Think about it. How can you add one apple to one orange? Easily, you claim the result is two fruit, but this requires some sleight of hand. You are forced to change horses midstream. You must introduce a new category, namely fruit, and discard the two old categories as though we are no longer interested in them. Numbers can only ever be a partial shadow of the various things they represent. And by partial here, I mean both biased and incomplete. We must deny the devil in the detail, or, or should that be Nietzsche's demon in the detail? However, we can never know if and when such demons will emerge to bite us. Then our carefully constructed defences of bias and incompleteness will fail along with our unconditional certainty in counting. The utility of numbers uh, is context sensitive. Try telling your bank manager that the counterfeit banknote uh, you have just proffered has the same value as a genuine money. Superficially, both genuine and counterfeit notes look exactly the same. However, just because you have chosen put both types into the same category of money, there is no guarantee that others will agree with you. The moment that the oneness of a category is brought into question, then your use of numbers will stall. Numbers equate similarity with sameness. Of course, the assumption of oneness, of superficial sameness, turns out to be very, very useful. It enables us to group together similar things and to count them as though they are the same. And counting opens the way for comparing and measuring. We cannot imagine a world without numbers. But the price we pay is that we must believe that numbers and categories represent a common objective truth. However, never forget that when you use numbers, you are making numerous subliminal assumptions, which may not be valid in every situation. It all depends on their appropriateness to the context. Numbers always hold the potential for error. There is no implicit truth in numbers. Only the utility that comes when your chosen assumptions are appropriate for your purpose. However, a change in context can negate that utility in an instant. Undeniably, numbers are useful. Subsequently, we keep on counting things, and counting, and counting, until suddenly arithmetic is, is forced to make a massive qualitative leap and posit the ultimate conclusion of counting, namely infinity. We are told that infinity is larger than every number, even larger than the number of atoms in the universe. But then we must run out of things to count before reaching infinity. Infinity is beyond counting, beyond arithmetic. And yet infinity is included in arithmetic. Infinity is treated like a number, albeit with singular properties. One plus infinity equals infinity. Two times infinity equals infinity. But infinity isn't a number. Infinity is abstract nonsense. The notion of equating infinity with some categorical thing is quite absurd. Arithmetic doesn't work at infinity, so how can you add to infinity or multiply by it? Nevertheless, we are told that 1 divided by infinity equals 0. In arithmetic, if a divided by b equals c, then a divided by c equals b. So, by implication, arithmetic must accept that if 1 divided by infinity is 0, then 1 divided by 0 becomes infinity. 
But, but what about when minus 1 is divided by 0? Is the result infinity, or should that be minus infinity? <laughs> minus infinity. Now, that really is absurd. And don't you dare ask about 0 divided by infinity. Mathematicians simply skate over these anomalous singularities. They use weasel words like tends to infinity, never equal to infinity. They tell you infinity doesn't have to be universally meaningful, just useful. It is perfectly acceptable to expand arithmetic so that it includes infinity as a categorical thing, but that it must be kept at arm's length. Mathematicians overlook the fact that infinity isn't a thing. They just posit infinity as an axiom. And anyway, who cares? As long as its properties stay consistent within the tunnel vision of this expanded arithmetic and that it proves to be useful, which it certainly is. As the famous mathematician John von Neumann once uh, stated, in mathematics, you don't understand things. You just get used to them. Mathematicians get used to the absurdities and in doing so, make them vanish. Once you have chosen to use numbers, then it is necessary to deny all the inevitable subtle problems that follow in their wake. No one bats an eyelid at infinity having an unknowable size or the fact that one divided by infinity is zero. And come to think about it, where on earth did zero come from? How can zero be a number when numbers are formed by counting, whereas zero comes from not counting? Zero simultaneously represents both the presence of nothing and the absence of something. It is both the nothing that is, by not counting, and the something that isn't. The number zero just pops out of subtraction, a newly invented operator defined by inverting addition. Zero then is defined as any number subtracted from itself. Subtraction then further expands arithmetic by bringing in the notion of negative numbers. This schizophrenic entity zero has proved very useful, as have the negative integers, and then fractions and real numbers and transcendental numbers, complex or so-called imaginary numbers. Of course, I would say that all numbers are imaginary. They are all magicked out of nothingness by the exploding self-reference of arithmetic. Every expansion of mathematics comes with its own forgotten absurdities. No matter once an intern internally consistent new mathematical idea finds a utility, or at the very least is deemed interesting, it will be subsequently accepted as existing, as being sensible, as being convincing, no matter how strange or absurd it may be. But Nietzsche warns us, what convinces us isn't necessarily true. It is merely convincing. I think back now again to my school days, and I still recall how, after a few weeks, I had cast aside all the initial doubts. I, I followed the path of least resistance. In fact, I studied pure mathematics all the way up to postgraduate level. Ultimately, I gained a PhD in algebraic number theory from the University of London. Having retired after 26 years as a professor of information systems at the LSE, and having completed uh, science's first mistake, I am now expressing my same doubts about science and mathematics in this series of videos. Indeed, I find myself wondering whether I persevered with my mathematical studies simply because I found it easy. I had learned the trick of denying all the absurdities lurking in the background. Uh, of mathematics. But then I ask, what about all those people who find mathematics difficult? Uh, is it because they have a limited intelligence? Of course not. All brains are number blind to a greater or lesser extent. Consciously or unconsciously, 
some people find it difficult to ignore the absurdity in this unnatural artificial idiosyncrasy called numbers. They are unable to look beyond the absurdity of numbers and of categories and they find themselves continually confronted by the singularity of everything in the world. And who is to say that they are not better off existing as they do in a state of grace where they find themselves appreciating the important uniqueness of all this world has to offer. I think that's enough for now of, of the absurdity in numbers. If you have found these unorthodox ideas interesting, then please do join me on future forays when I will be pointing out many more of the absurdities underpinning science, technology and mathematics. And please don't forget to download the free PDF of Science's First Mistake. Thank you.